Welcome to Dory Cody on Shamanism, a weekly podcast that explores one theme in shamanism throughout each month. Get comfortable, have a seat, and let's get started. Welcome to the December 2017 podcast. I am following a different format for this particular podcast. Typically, we do questions and answers. But this time, I am called to tell you a story of our ancient ancestors and the ways they understood and celebrated the winter solstice, which is upon us soon. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these tidbits of information and stories and blessings of hope and power that I share with you here. You've heard it said many times in the past year or more that we are currently living in very challenging times. We are pretty much surrounded by anger, fear, resentment, anxiety, and impatience as we celebrate a year of new leadership in Washington, D.C., for those of you here in the United States, and the worldwide anticipation of many possible changes in our daily lives and instability in our hearts and minds ensues from living in this unknown. No matter what your political beliefs, no matter where you come from on this planet, change is afoot, and much will be demanded of us as we navigate these changes, while at the same time practicing kindness for one another and holding the banner of love, light, and compassion for all beings. Those of us of good conscience and who care about the earth and all her beings must rise up now to this challenge during these demanding days. This is not a time or a place for surrender or laissez-faire. The earth demands action from us now to ensure her survival, and she is counting on us. Not only is the political climate of the world undergoing an upheaval and recreation, but our Earth's climate and what we have become accustomed to as normal in our everyday weather patterns is shape-shifting, and its new form is not always recognizable to us. Sixty years ago, it would have been unheard of to have temperatures in the 50s and 60s on a regular daily basis in the month of November in Maine. We would have been skating on frozen ponds before Thanksgiving and preparing to walk or skate across the iced-in rivers. Ice shacks would have dotted the riverbanks. These are all adjustments to our psyche that we have to navigate in order to be in balance, and this is demanding for those of us who are sensitive and spiritually inclined. Many of us are in tune with the collective conscience, and when that collective is angry, fearful, and negative, It is especially perplexing for us to navigate each day and stay centered in the light that we know we truly are. We are approaching the winter solstice. No matter what instabilities and other variables may surround us, we do know that the light will return again on the winter solstice. The earth will turn ever so slightly closer to the sun and we will begin counting the longer days of sunlight, even though by the paltry seconds added to the amounts of daylight each day. It is nevertheless hopeful and encouraging to know we are headed back towards spring. Unlike our ancestors who lived hundreds of years ago, we have the scientific knowledge that the sun will return on the winter solstice. Imagine for a moment how frightening it must have been to be in an era of human evolution when that knowledge about planets and the sun was not available. These ancestors truly had no way of knowing that the sun would actually return. Their lives were dependent upon the sun for survival, as are ours, of course, but they did not know in the Northern Hemisphere. They saw the sun was less available each day, and they did not know whether it would return to warm and lighten their days. They were freezing, 
They could not grow food. They made sacrifices of small animals and hung them on trees to entice the god of the sun to return. And they called on the shaman for answers. In the northern territories of Europe, in the Laplands and areas of Siberia, the people relied on the reindeer to communicate with the spirits using their antenna or their antlers. They asked about what the community needed in the way of sunlight. The people made fires and did ceremony every day and night, making offerings of meat and fish and berries. They adorned the trees with the skins and skeletons of small animals and the reindeer with bells and green boughs from the fir trees to keep away the dark spirits and seduce the spirit of the sun to come back to them. In these northern regions of Lapland and Siberia, they relied on the shaman who was, by the way, I find this amusing, adorned in red clothing with white fur trim as one more metaphorical means of luring the red sun to return. The shaman was the prophet, the seer, the psychologist, and the mystic who had the powers of divination. During these frightening days of the sun's apparent departure from the people, the villagers would call on the shaman to bring forth his or her gifts of prophecy. The tribal peoples, or villagers, depended on the shaman to climb a tree and using bells, he or she would dispense or dispel the potentially harmful spirits. The shaman would shimmy up the tree to the other worlds of reality to gather inspiration and information from the spirits. He or she would then return, climbing down the tree with gifts of wisdom wisdom, and answers to questions like, will we ever see the sun again? Will we have another harvest? Will there be enough reindeer dropping babies for us to make it through this dark time? As you can see, our knowledge of these ancestors of Northern Europe and Siberia is ripe with the historical background of our current stories of Santa Claus bearing gifts from the sky, flying with reindeer who use their antlers as antenna, with knowledge of where to go, and with the hope that these ancestors bore a free and peaceful and vibrantly alive world. A significant aspect of, the, of shamanism practiced in this part of the world during that time that I find quite interesting and inspiring was linked to the Amanita muscaria, also known as the fly agaric mushroom. This mushroom is more widely accepted and recognized in the wa- modern world as the Alice in Wonderland mushroom. It was held very sacred by these ancient people and was used by the shaman and others for ceremonial and spiritual purposes. Amanitas range from brightly red and white to golden orange and yellow. They only grow beneath certain types of evergreen trees and in that part of the world. They also form a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the tree, the exchange of which allows them to grow. One of the reported ancient beliefs was that the mushroom was actually the fruit of the tree. Due to the lack of seed, it is also commonly held that fly agaric was divine, a kind of virginally birthed sacred plant. Although intensely psychoactive, abanitos are also toxic. One way our ancestors found to reduce the toxicity and increase the psychoactive potency was to simply dry them. When out collecting the mushrooms, people would pick a bunch of them under the evergreen trees and lay them out along the branches of the tree while continuing to pick the mushrooms beneath other trees. The result of this was something that looked very reminiscent of a modern Christmas tree. Evergreen trees whose branches are dotted 
with bright red roundish decorations. In this case of our ancient ancestors, those decorations were the sacred mushrooms. At the end of the picking session, the shaman or harvester would go around to each of the mushroom stashes and put them all in one large sack. A large sack, does this sound like something familiar? Not only this, as the story of the tradition goes, the shaman would then, carrying this large sack, visit the homes of his or her people and deliver the mushrooms to them. They would then continue the drying process by hanging them in a sock near the fire. Another interesting parallel here to our modern practices. Another way they found to reduce the toxicity of the sacred mushrooms was through human filtration. Once passed through the body, the toxic elements are apparently filtered by the liver and the resultant urine that comes out contains the still intact psychoactive elements. So they drank filtered urine. But that's only half the story. Somewhere in the mythic origins of this practice is the reindeer. Because the reindeer also love these mushrooms. They dig through the snow to eat them, and they also drink their own urine afterwards. So, laughingly, perhaps, long ago, one of the first shamans witnessed the reindeer's love affair with this particular mushroom, as well as its, pro as well as its propensity for eating its own freshly yellowed snow, and saw how peculiarly it behaved as the romance heated up. The curiosity, which is indeed a hallmark characteristic of a shaman, couldn't be contained, and the shaman did what he had to do. He first ate some of the yellow snow himself, and without a doubt realized the profound wisdom and magic not only in the mushroom, but in the reindeer. And so this romance, too, began. However it may have happened in antiqu antiquity, the connection between the reindeer, the mushroom, and shamanism is apparent. A very common vision that one has while under the influence of fly agaric is precisely that, flying. Massive distortions of time and space occur, affecting scale in dramatic ways. Not only do you observe yourself flying, but also other things like reindeer. It's not that difficult to connect the dots here. Shamanic people are deeply invested in their environment. They learn the magical and mystical properties of the natural world and often assign a great deal of importance and sacredness to the bearers of that magic. For some of these ancient Siberian people, this power was charioted by the reindeer and the sacred mushroom. That the reindeer should have the ability to fly is evident not only in the vision or their clearly altered state once intoxicated, but also in the wisdom they offered to the shamans by eating the mushroom in the first place and for guiding them to do just the same. It was not only the reindeer who could fly, but the shamans also took flight. As mentioned, the shamanic journey or soul flight is a keystone in shamanic practice and especially so in ancient Siberian culture. In order to interact with the spirits, the shaman had to be able to leave this world and enter theirs. This was projected by, this was accomplished actually by projecting his or her spirit from the physical and into the immaterial or other realms. They either needed the power to do this on their own or use a spirit helper to take them. It is very common for shamans to develop relationships with birds, naturally, as they have the power to fly. But here in the North Pole, what better animal to use than the magical flying reindeer?
We all know, without a doubt, that the earth will turn back toward the sun and that the light of the sun will warm the earth again. But how can we align ourselves with this metaphor of the light returning at this time? Can we somehow set our inner clocks to align with shining more and more light? For surely our sanity and our salvation right now are dependent upon our ability to hold true to ourselves and the light within us during these shadowy and challenging times. Like our ancestors, perhaps this is a time to examine the inner recesses of your own heart and decide what sacrifices you are willing to make during these times of great inner darkness, uncertainty, and fear. Will you truly shine your light? Light your fire for the spirits to see. Can you show up for your tribe? Can you take flight outside of your body? Can you allow your heart to expand beyond the boundaries of your body? The people of the earth and all her beings are depending upon you. One way that I like to do this is by visualizing one lighted candle in a dark tunnel. It sheds a little bit of light for possible navigation through the darkness. But what if we had a thousand candles? Would, it, would we be able to follow one another through the dark tunnel and onto the other side and into the light? Might we be able to entice the spirit of the sun to return to us? Could we truly create peace on earth and goodwill for all beings? What gifts and prophecies will our navigating into the other worlds bring to us? In truth, in the end, we are truly privileged to live in these challenging times because we at least know the sun will return on winter solstice. Spirit has not left us. The sun has not left us. Hope has not left us. And we have not left each other we can together light a thousand candles to light the way through the tunnel for our village, for our people, for our tribe. We are not alone. I wish you a magical winter solstice time. And I leave you now with many blessings for a holy and sacred holiday season filled with hope, love, and compassion, and a thousand lit candles to guide your way. Thank you for listening to Dory Cody on Shamanism. We'd love to hear your thoughts, stories, reactions, and questions. Come on over to DoryCody.com and join the conversation. And tune in next week for more on this subject, or next month for a new subject. You can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or sign up on DoryCody.com to receive notices when the podcasts are posted. That's Dory, D-O-R-Y, and Cody, C-O-T-E, dot com. Drumming and Rattling by Dory Cody and Terry Morgan. Technical Assistance and Audio Production by Jill Hackett, dot com. And this is Susan Savell, wishing you many blessings in your life. We hope to have you join us next time. <laughs>